In January of 52 BC, Clodius was murdered in a gang battle on the Appian Way. We talked about this in our last episode. The lower classes of Rome went wild and burned down the Senate House, killing and looting as they went. Well, news of this was bound to spread beyond Rome, and it soon finds its way into free Gaul. But you have to imagine an ancient game of telephone, where the news gets altered and exaggerated slightly with each person it's told to. And of course, some people have an invested interest in distorting the message intentionally. By the time this news reaches free Gaul, people are going around saying that Caesar's been detained by a revolt in Rome and that he's unable to join his army in Gaul. With this news spreading throughout Gaul, every Gallic leader who finds himself chafing under the new shackles Caesar has placed upon them sees a rare opportunity. Rome is in revolt. Caesar is distracted and separated from his army. He's south of the Alps and it's winter with heavy snowfall. What better chance will they ever have than this? So some Gallic leaders meet at a secret assembly in a remote forest. There they bemoan the fate of the aristocrat Akko, who Caesar had flogged to death and beheaded. What a way to treat a Gallic aristocrat. In their minds, no better than a slave. And what probably bothered them the most, they have realized Caesar has the power to treat any of them just like this if they get on his wrong side. And this situation with Akko is only the tip of the iceberg. Up until now, Caesar has mainly fought the peoples of Belgica in the northern portions of Gaul and Germans in Gaul. On the other hand, the people of central and southern Gaul up to this point have never really risen up in mass against Caesar. In fact, a good chunk of them have been his allies. But now these tribes are waking up to the new reality in Gaul. Caesar and the Romans aren't leaving Gaul. They have armies now permanently stationed in Gaul, and Caesar expects tribes to obey his command. Somehow, their ally Caesar has managed to become their subjugator without ever really fighting a real war against them. And yes, some of these tribes had invited Caesar into Gaul to fight the Helveti and Ariovistus on their behalf, but that didn't mean that they wanted to become Roman subjects. Gaul deeply values its liberty. And now, tribes all around Gaul are waking up to this new reality. Even the tribes and leaders most closely allied with Caesar, and they aren't happy about it. They're realizing that they are not as free as they once were. Not as free as they were before Caesar and Rome arrived. And a note on the words freedom and liberty, these words are often twisted and they mean many different things to different cultures and even to different individuals. After all, the U.S. Founding Fathers stated, all men are created equal in a land that allowed slavery. And I'm not just picking on the U.S. Founding Fathers. This sort of twisted logic or hypocrisy is hardly unique to the U.S. Look at Republican Rome, so proud of its liberties and yet so happy to snatch liberty away from foreign peoples. So when the Gallic chieftains feel that they aren't as free as they once were, what do they mean by this? Well, for your ordinary Gallic man, this may simply mean freedom from being oppressed by foreigners. And I do specifically mean foreigners. Oppression by your own tribal leaders is fair game. Caesar describes the ordinary Gallic man as being treated by their leaders as no better than a slave, even stating that when they swear themselves to a Gallic noble to gain his protection, the noble has the same rights over them 
as a master has over his slave. This sounds a lot like serfdom to me. And of course, we should always keep in mind that this is Caesar's impression of Gaul. This is not their own history of themselves. But moving on to the Gallic aristocracy, what do they mean when they say they want freedom or liberty? Well, historian Adrian Goldsworthy writes, quote, Political liberty had been curbed by a supposed ally, and along with it had gone the freedom to raid and behead your neighbors, or to seize power by force within your own tribe. Chieftains were judged by the size of their retinues, but such followings of warriors were hard to support without regular warfare and raiding. End quote. When the freedom being talked about is the freedom to attack and behead your neighbors, it no longer sounds so high-minded anymore. Not that this is the only thing freedom means to the Gallic aristocracy, but it is a significant part of their idea of freedom. And to be clear, I'm not advocating for the idea that the Gauls didn't deserve freedom or that they would have been better off under Roman subjugation, I just think it's always important to be clear about exactly what words like freedom and liberty mean in any given context. Getting back to our secret meeting of the Gallic leaders, at this meeting these men devise a plan to cut Caesar off from his legions during winter when he will be south of the Alps and the winter season will make it difficult for him to rejoin his army. Plutarch says of their plan, quote, It being winter, the rivers were frozen, the woods covered in snow, and the level country flooded, so that in many places the ways were lost through the depth of snow. In others, the overflowing of marshes and streams made every kind of passage uncertain, all which difficulties made it seem impracticable for Caesar to make any attempt upon the insurgents. End quote. Also at this meeting, all of the Gallic leaders agree that death in battle is better than losing their freedom to Rome. As you can see, Patrick Henry was not the first person to express the sentiment, give me liberty or give me death. After this meeting, the Carnutes, one of the central Gallic tribes, then takes the lead and attacks the city of Cenobom, which is modern Olyon in France, early one morning. Taking the city, they slaughter the Roman citizens and take all the food gathered there along with all the Romans' property. And with this, the first blow has been struck and there is no turning back for the Gauls once you massacre Roman citizens. News of this massacre soon spreads like wildfire through Gaul. You see, the Gauls had this way of spreading news quickly, where they would shout news to each other across the countryside and in villages to spread the news around all of Gaul. Caesar says that by midnight, the news of this massacre had spread 160 miles away. Among the Gauls that the news of this massacre reaches is a young, exceptionally charismatic man of the Averni tribe by the name of Vercingetorix. And Caesar knows Vercingetorix, or at least knows of him, and tells us Vercingetorix had abilities second to none. In fact, Vercingetorix may very well have served as an auxiliary in Caesar's army and learned from the Roman ways of fighting. What's more, Vercingetorix is an aristocrat as blue-blooded as they come in Gaul. In fact, his very name hints at this, with the ending R-I-X, Rix, which means king. And the entirety of Vercingetorix's name means something along the lines of great or supreme king or leader of warriors or heroes. So if you take the most grand meaning of that name, it would be supreme king of heroes. What a name. Vercingetorix's father had won dominion over the whole of Gaul, according to Caesar. And his father was then put to death for the crime of trying to make himself king and Gaul his kingdom. So you could say Vercingetorix has a lot to live up to, but in many ways, he's up for the challenge. <laughs> 
and we can craft a narrative for the Gallic Wars in a thousand different ways. For example, we can view it as an example of thuggish Roman imperialism. We can look at the catastrophic human toll and maybe say that this was a genocide, as some historians do. Conversely, we can talk about the great benefits that Romanization brings to the Gauls. And all of these angles or narratives are true to varying degrees, and I don't necessarily think that they even contradict each other. The world, after all, is a complex place, and many different narratives can coexist and be true at the same time. But, if we are looking at the Gallic Wars through Caesar's eyes, as we have done throughout this podcast, and looking at it as a chance for Caesar to demonstrate his great abilities to the world, well then, there is one thing Caesar has been missing in the Gallic Wars up to now. Caesar has been missing a rival. Someone to push him to his limits. After all, how can Julius Caesar truly demonstrate his incredible abilities to the world and to posterity without some great rival to match himself against and in so doing to raise his abilities to new levels? And when we think about it, A huge theme in Julius Caesar's life is Caesar proving to the world just how great he is. Caesar knows in his bones that he's not just the greatest Roman alive, but the greatest Roman to have ever lived and the greatest Roman there ever will be. Caesar knows this. The problem is, the world doesn't know it yet. So Caesar has to prove it to them again and again, rub their faces in it until they can't ignore him anymore. And to do this, Caesar needs a great rival. Now, with the introduction of Vercingetorix to our story, Caesar has one. Getting back to Vercingetorix, after hearing about the massacre at Cenobom, Vercingetorix gathers his men together and rouses them to arms to join the fight. Vercingetorix's uncle hears of this, and he's a much more cautious man. So the uncle, along with some other leaders of the Averni, exile Vercingetorix from the town of Gergovia, which is the capital of the tribe of the Averni, Vercingetorix's tribe. But of course, Vercingetorix wouldn't be remembered today if he gave up so easily. Instead, he starts gathering followers from the countryside. Caesar calls these men vagrants and outcasts, but they may have just been warriors without a chieftain to follow. Now, they have one to follow. And with these followers added to his retinue, Vercingetorix returns to Gergovia and exiles the men who had so recently exiled him. Vercingetorix is then proclaimed king of his tribe by his followers, so like father, like son. And word of this spreads throughout Gaul, and soon almost all of the tribes west of the Averni, as far as the Atlantic Ocean, are rallying to his calls. Unanimously, these tribes select Vercingetorix as their supreme military commander. Now, Vercingetorix's leadership style is highly unusual for a Gallic leader. First, he's a man with attention to detail. He pays close attention to gathering supplies for his army. Second, Vercingetorix imposes rigid and brutal discipline on his army. Light offenses under Vercingetorix are punished by cutting off the offender's ears or gouging out one of his eyes. The offender is then sent home in disgrace as a visible warning to his people to stay in line and to obey Vercingetorix's orders. And that's the punishment for light offenses. For major offenses, the offender is punished by being burnt alive and all sorts of other tortures. With this sort of brutal discipline, Vercingetorix takes a bunch of disparate and quarreling Gallic tribes and forges them into a cohesive fighting force that obeys 
one man's orders, Vercingetorix. And he may very well have learned the necessity of discipline and logistics from fighting alongside the Romans. Upon gathering his army, Vercingetorix splits it in half and sends one half to attack the Remi, one of Caesar's most reliable allies in Gaul, and Vercingetorix himself with the other half then marches on a tribe called the Baturages. The Baturages are a minor Gallic tribe, but they are a dependent of the Aedui, and the Aedui are one of Rome's oldest and strongest allies in Gaul. So, as you can see, Vercingetorix's first strategy is to not go after Rome directly, but to pick off their Gallic allies. Well, the Aedui then go to the Roman winter camps in their territory where Caesar's legions are stationed, and they tell them about this attack. But the Roman commanders there are afraid to act without Caesar, and I mean, it's not too surprising considering what happened to Sabinus and Cotta when they left winter camp without Caesar. So the commanders there tell the Aedui to handle it themselves. You know, don't bother us with this crap. Handle it yourself. And of course, Vercingetorix is counting on this reaction. The Aedui then gather their army and go right up to the river that separates their territory from the Baturages, who, remember, are their dependent. But the Aedui do not cross the river. Instead, they linger there on their side of the river for a few days and then turn back and return home to their own territory. Now, the reason they give to the Romans for turning back like this is they say that they had received intelligence that the Baturages, their dependent, had defected to Vercingetorix, and that the call for help from the Baturages was really meant to lure the Aedui into a trap. And as soon as the Aedui turn back from the river, the Baturages openly declare for Vercingetorix. But what makes this whole story sketchy is the fact that even the Aedui, Rome's longest standing Gallic ally will eventually flip sides and join Vercingetorix. In fact, pretty much all of the tribes allied to Rome will turn on Caesar before the end of this revolt. So it's possible that the Aedui were really trying to lure the Romans into a trap even this early in the war. Even Caesar, writing after the war, says that this is still unclear to him. Now, as all of this is happening, as the revolt is gathering steam under Vercingetorix, Julius Caesar is in Cisalpine Gaul, one of his provinces, basically northern Italy, watching events in Rome from a distance while getting reports of this rebellion in Gaul. And the second Pompey takes control of Rome as sole consul, and the anarchy in Rome is put to an end, Caesar races off to Transalpine Gaul. Once there, Caesar faces a host of problems. The biggest is that he's separated from his army during a revolt. That's not good at all. By this point, Caesar's legions are an efficient, war-making machine. But without its brain, the machine is next to useless. Caesar is that brain. At the head of an army, Caesar is virtually unstoppable. But separated from his army... He's vulnerable, and so is the army. Vercingetorix knows this. It's why he's chosen to launch his campaign in winter while Caesar is distracted and away from his troops. So Caesar has to find a way to reunite with his legions. But if Caesar goes to his legions, it'll be a considerable risk to his own safety. Caesar will have to cross through potential enemy territory without an army, Unsure if he can even trust his allies. I mean, it would be a massive temptation for any Gallic leader to just betray Caesar, to kill him while his army isn't around, and in so doing, to become a Gallic hero of folklore. The rebellion would then gain incredible momentum, and the Romans would have no leader. On the other hand, if Caesar orders his legions to march to him, they may have to fight a battle against Vercingetorix on the way without Caesar at their head. That's not good either. Now, meanwhile, as Caesar is trying to figure out this whole issue, tribes are defecting left and right to Vercingetorix. 
and elements of Vercingetorix's army have now invaded Transalpine Gaul, one of Caesar's three provinces. Vercingetorix is really seizing the initiative here. This is the first time in the Gallic Wars the Gauls have gone on the offensive and attacked the Roman province. So Caesar decides that defending the province is his first priority. He races to the area of the attack, and once there, he organizes locally raised cohorts, along with some raw recruits he had brought with him from Cisalpine Gaul, into a defensive force. This defensive force then intimidates the invading Gauls, and they withdraw from the province. So, okay, one problem checked off of Caesar's to-do list, but he still has a lot more. Next on the to-do list is to seize back the initiative. See, this is a great lesson in life right here. It's never a good thing if you find yourself reacting to your adversary or just to events in general, running from one fire to another trying to put them out. Ideally, you want your adversary to have to react to you. Well, so far, Vercingetorix has had all of the initiative and Caesar is just reacting. It's time to change that. So Caesar takes what historian Adrian Goldsworthy calls an improvised and largely inexperienced force across the pass of the Cevennes and into Averni territory. And remember, the Averni are the tribe of Vercingetorix. But this journey across this mountain pass and into the territory of the Averni isn't an easy journey. Remember, it's winter and the pass is covered in snow. So Caesar has his men digging out six-foot snowdrifts to clear a path through the pass. And when they do, the Averni are utterly shocked to see the Romans. In the minds of the Averni, these mountains were an impassable wall in winter. Caesar says that even individuals couldn't travel the pass in winter, never mind entire armies. And once over the Alps, Caesar sends out the cavalry to burn and pillage widely. And after two days of this, Caesar leaves to head back to Transalpine Gaul, putting Decimus Brutus in charge of the cavalry and telling them that he would be back with reinforcements in three days. Of course, Vercingetorix soon learns of all this, and whatever his plans had been, whatever he had planned for Caesar in the Roman province, His plans have now changed. There is no way Vercingetorix can keep command of this army if he can't even show that he can defend his own home territory. So Vercingetorix now needs to react to Caesar's move. Caesar has re-seized the initiative. What's more, Caesar has no intention of returning to the Avernian territory. If this is a boxing match between two heavyweights... This whole invasion of the Averni territory is just a feint. Even Caesar's own troops don't know this, though. And once Caesar crosses the mountain pass again back into Roman territory, he suddenly changes direction to the surprise of his troops, picks up a cavalry force he had previously ordered to gather, and races at breakneck pace through the land of the Idoe and reaches two of his legions in winter quarters. And ancient historian Suetonius, possibly talking about this event, says that Caesar disguised himself as a Gaul to sneak through this territory. And Caesar's reasoning for possibly dressing as a Gaul and moving so fast and in secret is that he no longer trusts his ally, the Idoe. So he wants to make sure that by the time the Idoe hear that Caesar's in their territory, he's already reunited with his army. So Caesar reaches two of his legions in their winter camp and then orders the rest of the legions to march and to meet him at some designated location. By the time Vercingetorix hears about all of this, Caesar is already reunited with all ten of his legions. Ancient biographer Plutarch writes on this, but Caesar who above all men was gifted with the faculty of making the right use of everything in war, and most especially of seizing the right moment, as soon as he heard of the revolt, returned immediately the same way he went, 
and showed the barbarians by the quickness of his march in such a severe season that an army was advancing against them that was invincible. For in the time that one would have thought it scarce credible that a courier or express should have come with a message from him, he himself appeared with all his army, ravaging the country, reducing their posts, subduing their towns, receiving into his protection those who declared for him. End quote. Vercingetorix, upon hearing of this, then moves to retake the initiative. He marches on a tribe known as the Boii. The Boii are a dependent of the Idui, who Caesar personally settled after defeating them. So Caesar now has another dilemma. If Vercingetorix defeats the Boii, Caesar believes that all of Gaul will abandon him, since it will be clear to them that he can't even protect his own allies. On the other hand, it's still winter, and Caesar is very worried that if he marches his ten legions out of winter quarters, they won't find enough food on the land to live off of. So Caesar mulls this over, and in the end, decides that all must be risked to defend his allies. Leaving two legions behind to guard the baggage, Caesar takes the rest of the army and marches to the rescue of the boy. Along the way, he takes a town of the Senones in only three days because they surrender to him, and he then moves on to Cenobom. Remember, Cenobom is the town where the whole rebellion was kicked off. This is where the Roman citizens were massacred. Vengeance is in order. Now, the tribe that holds Cenobom, the Carnutes, had only recently heard of Caesar's siege of the previous town, and had then begun preparing for the defense of Cenobom, which they knew was coming. They expected Caesar would be bogged down on the first siege for some time. But then, two days after they get news of this siege even happening, Caesar's already at Cenobom, throwing the people of Cenobom into an absolute panic. By the time Caesar arrives at Cenobom, though, it's evening, so he holds off on a direct assault, Cenobom is situated along the River Loire and has a bridge over the river. So Caesar becomes concerned when he looks at the city that the inhabitants may try to flee in the night. So he stations two legions to watch the bridge throughout that first night. Just before midnight, the citizens of Cenobom do try to escape over that bridge, moving very quietly. Of course, the Roman sentries spot this. Caesar is alerted to this. He sets fire to the city gates, storms the city, and cuts off the escape of most of the people of Cenobom. Then, in Caesar's own words, quote, He, meaning Caesar, plundered the town and burnt it, gave booty to the soldiers, led his army over the Loire, and made his way to the land of the Baturages. End quote. Upon hearing this, Vercingetorix, who had been besieging a town of the Boii known as Gorgobina, abandons that siege and marches to meet Julius Caesar. Meanwhile, Caesar has already begun besieging a town of the Baturages called Noviodunum. Noviodunum at this point had probably already heard of what happened to Cenobom and decide that they don't want that same thing to happen to them. So they surrender to Caesar without a fight. So Caesar orders them to give him hostages and to give up their weapons and horses to him. Now, some of these hostages had already been given and some Roman soldiers were sent into the town to hunt for weapons and horses when suddenly Vercingetorix's cavalry appears in the distance. And the second the people of Noviodunum see this, they start closing their gates manning the walls, and arming themselves with weapons they had apparently hidden from the Romans. And the Roman soldiers inside the town realize that something is up, and so they draw their swords, seize the town gate, and get all of their men out to safety. Caesar then sends his cavalry against the cavalry of Vercingetorix, but Caesar's cavalry ends up getting into trouble and isn't doing so hot against Vercingetorix's cavalry, So he sends 400 German cavalry that he has in reserve. 
And Vercingetorix's cavalry aren't able to fend off the German attack, and they soon go running back to the main army of Vercingetorix with heavy casualties. Now, when the townspeople of Noviodunum see this from their city walls, they panic. They round up the people that they say are responsible for inciting the people of the town to resist a second time after they had already surrendered, and they hand these people over to Caesar and surrender yet again. Caesar, who is always merciful, is happy to accept their second surrender, and then marches off. Now, around this time, Vercingetorix holds an assembly. And at this assembly, he tells his supporters that they need to adopt a new strategy. Scorched earth. They need to deny the Romans food at all costs. And in order to do this, they need to burn all towns and buildings in the path of the Roman army. Not only that, but any town or city that isn't defensible has to be preemptively burnt so the Romans won't be able to storm these cities and towns to get supplies. Now, this strategy is very extreme. I mean, think about how attached an ancient person would be to the village or town, city, or farm that they were born in and expected to have their kids in and one day to die in. And then remember that all of this is happening in March. That's a cold month to be homeless in. And I have to imagine most of these people do become homeless or wandering refugees. The sources never exactly say. So consider all of this. And think about the strength of personality it takes to convince or else to coerce these people into putting their homes to the torch. Well, Vercingetorix has that strength of personality. And if all of this seems severe, Vercingetorix reminds his followers that it'll be far worse to be killed and to have their wives and children hauled off into Roman slavery. And that is exactly what will happen if the Romans win, he says. And with that sort of dire sales pitch, Vercingetorix's new brutal plan meets with unanimous approval and they start implementing it in all of the states in rebellion. Caesar says you could see fires in all directions. Now, even though Vercingetorix's coalition is on board with the Scorched Earth strategy, it's one thing to say, yes, people in other tribes should burn their homes, or people should burn their farms in the countryside. It's quite a different thing to say, we should burn our homes especially when those homes are part of a city that is considered the jewel of your tribe. That becomes the issue with the city of the Baturages, known as Avericum. The Baturages are no slouches on the scorched earth front. In fact, they burn 20 of their cities in one day. But they draw the line at Avericum. At an assembly of the Gauls, they beg Vercingetorix to exempt Avericum from being burned. They point out that it has excellent natural defenses and that it is almost the finest city in all of Gaul. It would be a shame to burn it. Vercingetorix opposes this exception, but the Paterages keep pushing, and eventually Vercingetorix relents and sends defenders to Avericum. Well... Caesar looks around, and he can see cities and towns being burnt left and right. You can imagine just columns of smoke rising up all over the horizon. And what do you think Caesar notices? Avericum is still standing. And Avericum has food. And Caesar doesn't think Avericum looks anywhere near as defensible as the Gauls seem to think. So Caesar marches his army in a beeline for Avericum and camps outside the city walls. Vercingetorix follows and camps some miles away from the city. Now, Avericum really is a difficult town to put under siege. Most of the city is surrounded by a river or by marshes. In fact, there's only a small portion of the city walls that even allow for an army to approach, 
This means that Caesar can't circumvallate the city as he normally would. Instead, he has to conduct the siege within this narrow corridor. So Caesar orders his army to build two siege towers with battering rams in them, and then to build two ramps leading up to the walls of Avericum to push the siege towers on. This kind of work leaves the Roman soldiers exposed to attack from the city walls, so Caesar has his troops build mantlets and sheds to protect the legionaries as they work on these operations. All of this construction is hard work, and if you've ever worked hard physically in your life, you know it makes you very hungry. Well, Caesar has 25 to 30,000 legionaries, along with a few thousand auxiliaries and an unknown number of camp followers and slaves to feed. This is a difficult force to feed at the best of times, but in March, before the crops have grown and when winter supplies are depleted, it's extremely difficult. Add to this the fact that the army is no longer moving and is just devouring all the food in the local area, and this becomes a big problem for Caesar and the Romans. Now, the Idui were supposed to be supplying food to Caesar, but they're doing this with what Caesar calls very little enthusiasm, and it's yet another sign that their loyalty is wavering. The food shortage gets worse and worse until the legionaries end up going several days without grain and are forced to survive solely on cattle that they had captured in faraway villages. In fact, Caesar says in his commentaries on the Civil War that his soldiers faced more privation at Avaricum than they did at Elysia. And Elysia is the famous siege where this whole revolt comes to a climax. Historian Adrian Goldsworthy highlights that there is a persistent myth out there that the Roman legions were vegetarians, and I've certainly heard this myth before myself. It is nothing more than a myth, though, sparked by misreadings of this and a few other passages. Reading that the Roman legionaries were forced to survive on cattle and how terrible that was has led some people to conclude that the Romans were vegetarians or that the army was vegetarians, Goldsworthy says that in reality, the legionaries ate a balanced diet of meat, grain, and vegetables. Anyway, getting back to the siege, despite all of these food shortages, Caesar says the morale of the legionaries was supreme. Caesar even goes to each of the legions in person as they are busy on the siege works and tells them that if the hunger is too hard for them to endure, he will put an end to the siege essentially showing them that he has their best interest in mind and isn't going to force them to starve. But it's also a very clever way to motivate the very proud legionaries. No one wants to be the person who comes to Caesar and says, Oh yeah, Caesar, I I just can't do this anymore. I'm too hungry. Call off the siege. These legionaries are veteran soldiers and they're far too proud to admit that. Instead, Caesar says that every one of them begged him not to put an end to the siege. For years, they say, they had served under his command without incurring dishonor or abandoning any action that they had undertaken. They would now consider it a disgrace to abandon this siege and are willing to endure any hardship to avenge the citizens massacred at Cenobon. As all this is happening... Vercingetorix is having to deal with his own food shortages. After running out of food, he picks up camp and moves his army closer to Avaricum. Then, Vercingetorix leads out his cavalry and light infantry to set an ambush for the Roman foragers. Caesar gets word of this, though, either through spies or scouts or prisoners, and he realizes that the Gallic camp is without its leader while Vercingetorix tries to set this trap. So Caesar marches with most of his army to the Gallic camp. And that's another point that should be made about Julius Caesar as a commander. Though he typically has a plan, if some new opportunity arises that looks more promising, Caesar has no problem abandoning the plan to see if the new opportunity will bear fruit. And even just abandoning his plan temporarily and trying out the new option, if it doesn't work, returning to the plan. 
In other words, Caesar's opportunistic and never gets rigidly stuck in one plan. Now, the new Gallic camp has excellent natural fortifications when Caesar gets there. It is on a hill surrounded by marshes. But despite these massive terrain disadvantages, the Roman legionaries are chomping at the bit to attack the Gauls anyway. Caesar refuses to allow them to attack, though. He tells them that though they would be victorious, many brave men would die, and seeing as how willing they are to take any risk to win him honor, he himself would deserve utter condemnation if he did not treat their lives as more valuable than his own safety. And this is yet another bonding moment for Caesar and his army. This is not a typical sentiment expressed by Roman commanders. Many a Roman commander would have been happy to send all of his legions at this hill and watch them die to get the victory. Caesar doesn't behave that way. He's happy to allow the war to drag out as long as he prevents his legionaries from dying. So, instead of attacking, the Romans march back to their camp and continue with the siege works. Meanwhile, Vercingetorix returns to his camp only to be accused of treachery. You see, some of the Gauls think that he is now in league with Caesar since as soon as he left with the cavalry, Caesar and the Romans arrived at the camp. So as you can see, even though Vercingetorix is their supreme war leader, this is still a very fractious group, more accustomed to distrusting and fighting each other than to working together. It's not for no reason that Vercingetorix is Caesar's great rival in the Gallic Wars, though. And with his charisma and force of personality, he soon puts an end to this talk. He then brings out what he claims to be captured Roman prisoners. And Caesar says that they were really just Roman slaves captured while foraging, that Vercingetorix had tortured, imprisoned, starved, and then had coached them on what to say in front of his army. So these slaves or soldiers, depending on who you believe, then paint a dire picture of the Roman army's situation, saying that they had been forced by hunger to escape the Roman camp in search of food. They also tell the Gauls that the whole Roman army is starving and don't have the strength for any strenuous effort. In fact... If the Roman army didn't make any progress on the siege in three days, these men tell the Gauls Caesar is planning on withdrawing. Now, whether these men were soldiers or slaves, these were all lies being planted by Vercingetorix to encourage his army. In reality, the Romans have a massive amount of fight left in them. The Gauls don't know this, though. And they cheer Vercingetorix. Their morale is renewed. They are clashing their weapons together in approval. And Vercingetorix has gone from traitor to hero with dizzying speed. The Gauls then send 10,000 picked men to bolster the defenders of Avaricum. Meanwhile, the siege of Avaricum has become a battle of wills and of ingenuity. Caesar says of the Gauls, quote, they are an extremely resourceful people, and particularly at copying and putting into practice anything they are taught. End quote. The Gauls are using nooses to counteract the Roman grappling hooks. They have built towers on every section of their walls and covered them with animal hides. And as the Roman siege towers get higher due to the ramp that they are on, the Gauls add scaffolding to their towers to make them even taller. The Gauls are making sorties out of Avaricum day and night, attacking the Romans and trying to put the siege constructions to the torch. And perhaps the wildest thing of all is that not all of the siege is happening above ground. Caesar says the Gauls were experts at every kind of tunneling due to the iron mines they build in Gaul. And they are putting that expertise to use by tunneling underneath the Roman earthworks to literally undermine them and to make them collapse. Meanwhile, the Romans are digging tunnels of their own, which the Gauls are trying to sabotage by driving large stakes into the Roman mines from above or by dumping boiling pitch or heavy rocks into the Roman mines on the Romans. 
And as this battle is being waged, there is just a continual downpour of rain. And it's March, so it's cold out. But Caesar is not hiding away in his tent to stay warm and dry. He is by the siege works all the time, encouraging his men, telling them not to cease their efforts for so much as a moment, and all the while keeping an eye out for danger to them. Both sides persevere through these awful conditions, and 25 days into the siege, the Romans have built their ramp 330 feet wide and 80 feet high, and it's almost at the point of reaching Avaricum. But of course, the Gauls can see this too. And that night, they light the timber that is holding up their tunnels, which stretch underneath the Roman ramps. And the Roman ramps are made up of a mixture of dirt and wood, so this is not good. The Roman sentries begin to notice smoke coming up from the ramps, and at the same moment, a shout goes up from the walls of Avaricum, and Gauls come streaming out of two gates in the walls to attack the Romans and their fortifications. As this happened, Gauls on top of the city walls begin throwing down torches and timber along with pitch onto the Roman ramp to try to burn it. Fortunately for the Romans, Caesar keeps two legions on guard duty at all times. These men rush out to defend the siege work, but even Caesar admits it seemed impossible to know what they should prioritize first. Eventually, though, they get organized, and some of the Romans fight off the Gauls who came out of the gates, while others pull back the siege towers to safety, and yet others break up parts of the ramps so the fire can't spread beyond where it's already taken hold. And still the fighting rages even as night turns to day. The Gauls are constantly sending in fresh reinforcements and replacing tired soldiers. They are fighting for their very existence. Caesar says in his commentaries, quote, They, meaning the Gauls, believed that at that very moment, the salvation of Gaul hung in the balance. End quote. As this battle rages, Caesar says he personally witnesses acts of astonishing bravery on the part of the Gallic defenders. You see, the Gauls form a line on the city wall and start handing lumps of tallow and pitch from man to man until the flammable substances reach the man at the end of the line who then throws the substance onto the fire below to feed it. So the Romans aim one of their scorpions, which is essentially a giant crossbow, at the man throwing the pitch and tallow and nail him with a bolt, killing the man. But without hesitation, another Gaul steps over his dead body and takes his place, knowing that the scorpion is still aimed at his position. Again, the scorpion shoots, and again the Gaul at the front of the line is hit and killed. Now a third Gaul steps in without hesitation, again knowing that he will be killed. And when he is killed, a fourth man steps in to take his place. Caesar says they kept at this until the fire was put out and the fighting was over. After this failed sortie, the Gauls decide that they had given their all in this battle and had still been defeated. So, at Vercingetorix's order, the warriors decide to flee from the city under the cover of darkness that very night to join the army, leaving the civilians of Avaricum behind. But as the warriors are getting ready for this nighttime escape, the married women come out and throw themselves at the men's feet, throw themselves at their husbands' feet, weeping, begging them not to leave them and the children to be tormented by the Romans. The men ignore them and continue their preparations. After all, as Caesar says in the commentaries, quote, For in general, at times of extreme danger, panic allows no place for pity. End quote. When the women realize that the men are going to leave anyway, they begin to cry out and alert the Romans that the men are fleeing. This makes the Gallic men fearful that the Romans will catch them, so they give up their plan and stay in Avaricum. The next day, the Roman ramp is completed, but a fierce storm blows in with heavy rains. 
Caesar takes a look at Avaricum amidst the driving rain and realizes that the sentries are being pretty careless. And so he decides that this is the moment for attack during this torrential downpour. So Caesar secretly lines his men up hidden behind shelters and sheds near the siege works. And then Caesar gives them a rousing speech amidst the driving rain and promises them great rewards to the first men over the wall. And with that, he gives the signal for battle. The Romans rush out and quickly occupy the wall of Avaricum, even as the rain pours down. This sends the Gauls into a panic, and they rush down from their walls and towers and gather to make a stand in the marketplace and other open spaces of the city. But as they look around the city of Avaricum, they see that the Romans aren't coming down from the walls. Instead, the Romans are spreading out around the city walls, occupying every part of them. And suddenly, the Gauls realize that they're going to be surrounded and trapped inside the city. In a panic, they throw away their weapons and make a break for the furthest reaches of the city where the Romans haven't occupied the walls yet. There, in an attempt to all escape at once, a bottleneck forms and people are crushed in the surge of humanity and killed by the Roman soldiers. Those who do manage to escape the city are mostly hunted down by Caesar's cavalry. As for the people still in Avaricum, well, I'll let Caesar tell you that in his own words. Caesar says in his commentaries, quote, Not one of our men gave a thought to booty. They were so severely provoked by the massacre at Cenobom and the effort they had put into the siege that they spared neither the elderly nor the women nor even the little children. End quote. Caesar goes on to say that of the 40,000 people in Avaricum, barely 800 survive and escape to reach Vercingetorix. Writing on this, historian Adrian Goldsworthy says, quote, Throughout history, troops who have stormed a fortified position have often been inclined to run amok once inside. Sieges have always been difficult and dangerous operations, the actual assault even more hazardous, and it was often hard for men who had endured both to switch off once they were inside, especially since in the narrow streets they were no longer under the close gaze of their officers. When a town was stormed, it was normal for anyone who showed even the slightest resistance to be killed while women were raped. End quote. Now, Goldsworthy goes on to say, and I agree, that it seems unlikely that Caesar ordered this massacre. After all, if he had, he probably would have owned it, like he does other massacres. In the Roman world, there wasn't really something you bothered to hide. Instead, it seems far more likely that the troops just vented their accumulated rage and frustration after a long, cold, wet, and hungry siege on the inhabitants of Avaricum. But even if Caesar didn't order this massacre, think about the type of societal sensibilities that would lead Caesar to put such atrocities in writing for the history books and send these writings back to the Senate and the people of Rome without worrying that it might negatively reflect upon him or his army. Think about what sort of culture would have to exist in Rome for you to advertise the killing of little children and women and the elderly. In fact, one of the reasons Caesar points all of this out is to show his audience that his soldiers weren't motivated by greed in sacking a Vericum to capture and sell slaves. After all, they would have made a lot of money from selling 40,000 people into slavery. Instead, Caesar is pointing out that his troops are sacrificing this money because they are motivated by higher ideals, like avenging the massacre of Roman citizens. That is a sort of moral logic utterly alien to us today. It doesn't compute how killing children can make you moral, but the ancient world viewed the world 
very differently from us today. Ancient Rome can, at times, feel so familiar, so similar to modernized countries today. But then, you come across something like this. And it reminds you of how brutal and ruthless Rome can be. How brutal Caesar can be. And it's not just Caesar and Rome. It's the entire ancient world. This is not a world of predators and victims, where victims are held aloft as moral survivors and predators denigrated as monsters. No. This is a world solely filled with geopolitical predators. It's dog-eat-dog, and Caesar and Rome just happen to be the biggest dogs in the neighborhood. And if you don't believe me, take classicist scholar Mary Beard's word for it. She says in her book SPQR, quote, In acquiring their empire, the Romans did not brutally trample over innocent people who were minding their own business in peaceable harmony until the legions appeared on the horizon. Roman victory was undoubtedly vicious. Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul has not unfairly been compared to genocide and was criticized by the Romans at the time in those terms. But Rome expanded into a world not of communities living in peace with one another, but of endemic violence, rival power bases backed up by military force. There was not really an alternative backing, and many empires. Most of Rome's enemies were as militaristic as the Romans, but for reasons I shall try to explain, they did not win. End quote. And that is where we'll end our episode today. In our next episode, Caesar takes the fight to Vercingetorix's tribe and their capital of Gergovia. But before we go, let me say thank you to one of our new patrons. His name is Dave Cefali. Dave has committed to putting forward some of his hard-earned money to help support the March of History. He is now an auxiliary in our Roman army, and I welcome him on board. This podcast wouldn't be possible without patrons like you, Dave. So from the bottom of my heart, I say thank you. Now, you may have noticed this episode sounds slightly different than the previous episode. Hopefully it sounds even better than the previous episode. I told you in the last episode that I got a new mic, thanks to generous contributions from our patrons and PayPal contributors. But a new mic, sadly, is not so simple as just plug and record. There are many settings on it that I've had to fiddle with, so hopefully as I get those settings set, the episode qualities improve. And one last thing before we go, we have a five-star review to read from Sidemeister on Podcast Addict. He left this review on January of 2021, but I did not realize that Podcast Addict allowed reviews, so my apologies, Sidemeister, but I'm just getting to it now. He says in his review, Amazing podcast for everyone interested in ancient Rome. A lot of focus on Julius Caesar. Hopefully they will touch even more on other great Roman figures in the future. Thank you so much, Sidemeister, for the five-star review. I certainly try to make this podcast a little bit broader than just a biography about Julius Caesar. I mean, it is a biography about Julius Caesar, so of course there's a lot of talk about him, but I certainly try to include talk of Cato and Cicero, Crassus, and other Romans as well. And future biographies will be about people that aren't just Romans, will hop throughout history after we finish with Julius Caesar and the fall of the Republic, but we still have a ways to go on that front. That is it. If you aren't following us on all of the social media platforms that we're on, please do so. You can find them in the show notes of every episode. If you want to be a patron like Dave Cefali, or if you want to contribute per episode or just a one-time fee on PayPal, you can find those links in the show notes as well. Thank you all for listening, and I will see you on the next episode of the March of History.